All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. All right. So this this is like my third time trying to record this thing. I've had a lot of technical difficulties going on my laptop. I don't know exactly what's going on, but um we're gonna try to get through it, you know what I'm saying? We're not gonna let, you know, what's call it any technical difficulties stop me from giving out this word, you know what I'm saying? So firstly before I start anything, I'm gonna give all praises to you, how about Shimmy How who the world calls uh, Jesus Christ. Um and I just wanna like you know thank him just for everything that's happened in my life. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm just going to give all praises to him because without him, none of this is possible. Like, literally, none is, none of, nothing, is impo- nothing is possible, you know what I'm saying, without him, you know what I'm saying? So I just want to kind of go ahead and get into it and just explain what God's word says about who did Christ come for? Who did Christ come for? For the Israelites, I'm going to explain a lot of this stuff because a lot of people you know what I'm saying? A lot of people sit here and, and think that, oh, Christ came for everybody. He died for everybody. But his word says otherwise. And when you read his word thoroughly, you'll see exactly like you know who he came for. And you'll understand, you know, the context of what his word, what his word is trying to say. But I'm gonna kind of go ahead and get into it. And what I'm gonna do is that I'm going to basically explain and break down a lot of verses that Christians may use to say that Christ came for everybody and that Christ, you know, died for everyone's sins. So I'm going to just bring up a few verses, then I'm going to break down you know, those verses. So the first verse that a lot of Christians use, John 3, 16, for, it's very cliche, for God to love the world, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And there's also uh, there's also another verse in First John, I think it's two and two. Yeah, he is the prop- prop- propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. So a lot of people use these verses, you know what I'm saying, to say that oh, Christ died for everybody's sins. So for one. There are, there are two different ways you can approach this argument with this whole world thing. Two different ways. So for one, the easiest thing I can do, the easiest thing I can do is firstly, I'm going to go to Hebrews. I'm going to go to Hebrews to get some context on, first of all, how God created worlds. Because, well, let me go back real quick. Go back real quick. So when you go to John 3, 16, and look up that word world in the Greek. It means cosmos. Cosmos. That word cosmos is referring to an arrangement or constitution. Order government. Basically, like, you know, there's like a appointed government of people or arrangement of people that he's being referred to. The human family. Inhabitants of the earth. Man, it's, it's referring to specific people. It's not talking about, you know, the entire world. Because if it was, it will go against the whole context, you know what I'm saying, that I'm trying to, like, you know, it's, it's trying to refer to. But let's, then let's go to Hebrews 1 and 2 real quick. When you go to Hebrews 1 and 2, it lets you know how God created worlds right here. It says, hey, in Hebrews 1 and 2, half in these last days spoken unto us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Plural. Worlds. He made worlds. Even if you look at that word in the Greek, the universe. It could also mean like you know, in a, in like a period of time. It could mean an age. It could mean the world. It could mean it can mean these different things. But in this context, it's talking about the entire world, the entire universe. How there are different worlds he made, and different nations of people that he made. So there is a specific nation or specific world. That he that he came for, he didn't come for the entire world. Because if he did, then then what does this mean then? Did it say he did it, did it say he came for the worlds? Did you say that he that he died for the sins of the of the worlds? It's plural. The way that God made this Bible is is very you know it's very deep and complex. But there are certain little rudimentary things and rudimentary concepts 
that people can, you know, overlook if they don't use the right precepts, the right verses to, un to understand doctrine, understand, understand scripture. But to, to go, I'm going to go to Isaiah 45 verse 17. Like I said, this is just a, a quick, like two, two to three minute cut you can do on this whole, you know what I'm saying? He died for the, for, you know, everybody in the entire world. Let's, let's see who this world is according to the word. So Isaiah 45 verse 17, it reads, but Israel shall be saved in the Lord with an everlasting salvation. Ye shall not be ashamed nor confounded world without end. Plain and simple. Plain and simple. It is it just it just called Israel a world. Right there. It literally just called Israel a world. So that world in John 3 16 in 1 John 2 and 2 is referring to Israel. Anytime it's talking about salvation, it's always in reference to Israel and nobody else. If you think it is, I can break it, I can break it down. Not even just me, I can just use what the what the what the Bible says. The Bible is all I need. I can I can bring up, you know what I'm saying, historical, you know, uh sources and other things to you know prove my point, but I can just use the Bible simply to to prove to prove the point that the Bible is trying to make. God's word is, is always when it comes out of salvation, it's always referring to Israelites and nobody else. And if you don't believe me, let me get this verse real quick. Um this verse right here. Acts 5 and 31. I'm, I'm going to start at verse 30. It says right here, The God of our fathers raised up Yahweh whom ye slew and hanged on a tree. Him hath God exalted with his right hand to be prince and a savior. So God have exalted Yahweh. He exalted Yahweh to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to who? To give repentance to Israel. And forgiveness of sins. A lot of people want to sit there and, and say and say things like you know, and without having the actual context and having the actual evidence to back up what they're saying. You can't just make that blanket statement and just say that, oh, you know, he died for everybody, because that's who he is. He, he's a, he's all loving. He loves everybody. But you don't bring up any verses to, to prove prove your point. And even those those verses that you may bring up, you may not even have a true understanding of them. So we got to break it down for y'all. But it's all right, though. It's all right, because, you know, a lot of us have been lied to. All of us have been lied to, to be honest. And we haven't been told the truth. But this truth is coming out day by day. You know what I'm saying? It's coming out day by day, year by year. And it's going to continue to come out until the return of Christ. But it's, it's right here, plain and simple, right in front of your face. He gave, he gave repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. If that doesn't prove it, that, that I, I, like, like I like I said, I can give more, but you know this is just sim plain as plain and simple of how you can just disprove that whole notion that he came for the whole entire world, and you can you can break down the Greek of the word world. You can also use Hebrews one and two, and use Isaiah forty five seventeen, and that's 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 like a, a quick a quick very quick cut on John three sixteen, very quick, very quick. I can go, I can go the other route and explain John 3 14, but I'm gonna just, you know, kind of leave it right there uh, on, on that whole notion of like John 3 16 and also first John 2 and 2. But another argument that a lot of Christians may may say when it comes down, well, also first of all, before I even go to that next argument, let me also bring up Matthew 15, 24. Because this this is who Christ said he came for. There's, there's no there's no denying this. This 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 is out of Christ, Yahweh Shah's own mouth. He said right here in Matthew 15, 24, but he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of who? The house of Israel. Plain and simple. This is who Christ came for. He, he didn't come for nobody else. He did not come, you know, for everybody in the entire world. He came for his people, which are the Israelites. That's who he came for. He did not come for anybody else at all. And the fact that people sitting here 
and there's too, there's there's so much evidence to like that I can give. You know what I'm saying? And I can I can give. I have many conversations conversations with Christians about this stuff, and yet they still don't want to like want to accept it. Catholics are the worst. <laughs> they Catholics are the worst because no matter no matter how much how much information you give them, they always go based off their own opinion. It's like oh you know well even though you brought up that verse, but what I believe is that Christ died for all. And it's like, it doesn't matter what you believe at all. It don't matter at all. What the Bible says, that's what the Bible says. Forget your feelings. That What, 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 what does the Bible say? Not, not what you believe in, not what you think. What does the Bible say? And plain and simple right here, the Bible says, Christ said himself, I am not sent but to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. There's no way you can get around that. If there's a way that you think you can, go ahead and try to. Either way, you're not going to win. You're not going to you're not going to defeat God's word at all. You're not. But let's get you know go into the go into another argument that a lot of um Christians may use when it come down to um the whole salvation argument. I'm gonna go to Galatians three and twenty eight. So. It reads right here, there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither neither free nor bond, there is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Christ Jesus, Yahweh Shah. So, a lot of people use this verse to say that, oh, see right here, since it's saying that there's no difference, but there's no difference between them, this means that everybody can receive salvation. Everybody can be saved. But when you understand exactly why he's saying this, it'll make sense. He's not saying this for no reason. Plus one, let, let's, let, let, me, let me do this real quick. I think it's in Acts. I think it's Acts 5 and 20. I think it's right here. Um, let me see what verse it was. Talking about the Grecians. But there was a verse that specifically talked about the Grecians. Acts 11 and 20. It's locked. It's locked. Acts 11. There we go. And 20. So right here. I'm a, I, matter of fact, I'm going to read verse 19 first. And then I'm going to go into verse 20. And then break it down. So I'm going to explain the reason why he said there's no difference between Jew and Greek. There was a reason why he said that. So. Read right here in verse in verse 19. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phoenix, Phoenix, um, and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to, to none but oh, hold up, Slokia. Preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So the context right here, let you know who 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 is he giving the word to. It says he's preaching the word to none but to the Jews only. Only to the Jews, only. Now, if you read, it says, and some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ, Yahweh. So people may read people read this with a carnal mind, not trying to you know figure out and break down, you know, what I'm saying the etymology and also break down um the Greek translations of certain words. So, this word right here, Grecians, people may be like, oh, see, look, look right here. It says that he, he preached to the Grecians. He spoke to the Grecians. It's, this is not a contradiction if you break down what this word means. Let's go to the Greek and see what this word means. Grecians. G1675. This word right here means a Hellenist. The biblical usage of this word is a Hellenist. One who imitates the manners and customs or the worship of the Greeks and use the Greek, Greek tongue. Used in the New Testament of Jews born in foreign lands and speaking Greek. So for, your, for those who don't know who a Hellenist is, a Hellenist is, a, is someone who is a part of the uh, Hellenization period. If you ever heard of Hellenism or Hellenization, let me, let me just look it up real quick. Hellenization. So right here, Hellenization 
or Hellenism is the historical spread of ancient Greek culture, religion, and to a lesser extent language over uh, foreign peoples conquered by Greeks or brought into the, the sphere of influence, particularly during the Hellenistic period. So right here, and uh, matter of fact, let me also hold up. Let me, uh, hold up. I know there was another, give me a second. Matter of fact, let me, cause we ain't going to Google too. Y'all look real quick, just, just look real quick. The adoption of Greek culture, religion, language, and identity by non-Greeks, by non-Greeks. So these Grecians right here were not actual Greeks. They were Hellenistic, Hell Hellenistic people. They were non-Greeks. So when you sit here and say things like, oh, Salvation was given to the Greeks and the Gentiles as well. No, it was not. These Greek people, if you as as you as I as I just did, I broke down that that word meant Hellenist, and the fact that it's talking about people or Jews and Israelites who are part of the Hellenization period. That's what it means. So when it says there's there's neither Jew nor Greek, it's saying that because of the fact that they're the same. Like these people are the same people. It's just that one of them, they know who they are, and the others don't. Plus, it says right here, when it says down, they were scattered abroad. This is a part of the curses in Deuteronomy. Let's go to the Deuteronomy real quick. Deuteronomy 30, I'll start at uh, verse 1. It shall come to pass when all these things are come upon thee, the blessing and the curse, which I have set before thee, that shall call them to mind among all the nations, whether the Lord thy God have driven thee. Now, I'm also going to verse 3. That then the Lord thy God will turn thy captivity and have compassion upon thee, and will return and gather thee from all the nations, whither the, whither the Lord thy God have scattered thee. Plain and simple, right there in front of your face. These Israelites, because th those are the people that, that's been scattered, but these Israelites, they were the ones who, who um, what you call it, um, are being referred to. Now, let me, let me see. Uh, let me see. Because there's a verse that um, is in context. There's a verse in context. I'm going to see if I can find it real quick. I think it says, go rather to Matthew 10 and 6. There we go. Matthew 10. Don't play with me. 10. So, right here, it says, the 12, the 12, Yahweh Shah, Jesus sent forth. And commanded them, saying, "Go, go not into the way of the Gentiles." Well, so hold up, hold up, hold up. So, if the Gentiles can be saved, if the Gentiles can receive salvation, why is Christ saying right here, "Go not into the way of the Gentiles"? Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of who? Israel. Plain and simple. Right in front of your face. Christ himself, like these, this this scripture is, is just so like God is so good because like bro, it's 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 letting you know exactly what's going on. It's letting you know exactly who he came for. It's letting you know exactly who he who, who this word was preached to. This word wasn't meant for anybody else, it wasn't meant to be given to all. Salvation wasn't wasn't meant to be given to all. There is too much evidence I'm giving y'all that's letting you know exactly who Christ came for and who Christ wants to be saved, who Christ, who Christ died for. He didn't die for the sins of everybody in the entire world. He didn't. It's letting you know exactly who he, who he wants to preach, who he wants to wants the word to preach, be preached to. Say right here, go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Even in Matthew 15, 24, like I just brought up, you know, a few minutes ago, saying how he came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
That lets you know exactly where he's at. Exactly where he's at. Now, I'm going to go to Romans real quick. Because a lot of people want to use this whole, you know, Gentile Greek thing. Because I'm going to break down a little bit, a little bit more. A little bit more arguments that people may use when it comes down to the Gentiles and all that stuff. Let me see where it's at. Where is it at? Um, I'm gonna kind of I'm gonna kind of break down Romans 11 a little bit because I even though like I didn't I didn't I didn't really attend to do like a full breakdown but I'm gonna do it for this video. So Romans 11 I'm start at verse 16. It reads and this 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 is the whole tree analogy. People when people they say oh the Gentiles can be grafted in. But I'm going to explain exactly who these Gentiles were. So if you read, it says, for if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. The branches are the, the branches are the people. And if you go back to my um, first video that I made talking about um, trees are people in the Bible, like I, it, I explained how, you know, branches are, are dues to um, what you call it, uh, symbolize people, basically. But. Verse 17, and if some if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree, work grafted in among them, and with the and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the but the root deep. So when these branches, when these branches are broken off, don't sit there and boast against them. Don't sit there and be so proud and be like, oh, like, oh you're gonna be cut off forever, and that God doesn't care about you. Like, no. God still cares about these these branches these branches that are broken off because if He didn't, He wouldn't even have to He wouldn't even have mentioned them having a chance to be grafted back in. But let's continue to read. It says, "Um, Thou will say then the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. So because of unbelief of Yahweh, God of our power, because of unbelief of this word, they were broken off." They were, they were rejected because they went away from, you know, God. It went away from, you know, the, the true, uh, what you call it, knowledge of the word. Let me go to Hosea 4 and 6 real quick. It says right here, Hosea 4 and 6. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Because thou hast rejected knowledge, I will also reject thee. That thou shalt be no priest to me, seeing thou hast forgotten the law of thy God, I will also forget thy children. So that's the same thing that's being talked about right here. Um, because of unbelief of that knowledge that of the, the knowledge of the word and the law and just of God in general. So because of that, you know, they basically went to serve other gods and everything. They were broken off. They became Gentiles by flesh. Now I'm gonna also bring up that verse in a minute, but I'm just stay focused on this for real quick. But continue to read. But if God spared not the natural branches, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Uh, let me get to the point. Um. Let me get to the point. Well, I'm just continue to read. And they also, if they abide not still in unbelief. So if they if they come back to their beliefs, they shall be grafted in. It says right here, for God is able to graft them in again. So these Gentiles, first of all, these Gentiles, if you go into the Greek culture, in the Greek culture, they didn't have any belief in God anyway. They didn't have any belief in the true and one and only true God, Yahweh. They didn't have belief in him anyway. They didn't, they did not serve him. They had many other gods like Zeus and uh, Hermes and uh, Aphrodite, uh, Hercules. They, they had all these other gods. They didn't believe in, in, in the actual one true, one and only true God. They, they didn't, you know, really serve Yahweh Shah. They didn't serve Yahweh at all. So how can they be grafted in if, in if they were never like in belief in the first place? They were never in belief in the first place. They, they, they already had, you know, they were born into believing in the other gods anyway already. So how can they be grafted in if they did not believe in Yahweh anyway? That doesn't make any sense. A part of the a part of the culture of you know uh Yahweh is that they had belief in him and that they followed his ways and his word and his doctrines. They didn't follow any other doctrine but his word. So how can they be grafted in if they didn't follow that in the first place at all? But that's neither here nor there. You hear nor there. But continue to read verse 25. For I will not, brethren, 
that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. And so all Israel shall be saved. So once again, first of all, if you go back to the other verses I brought up, it, they, they, it said, Christ himself said, do not, do not go to the Gentiles, don't go to them, don't go to the Samaritans, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and preach to them. So for one, is it a contradiction right here? When it says all Israel shall be saved, but the, but the Gentiles become in? No, once again, if you realize those Gentiles and those Greek people are actual, you know, um, Israelites who were converted to Gentiles. That's what it is. It's not talking about, you know, actual, uh, what's called it, like heathen born, like blood, blood heathens. It's not talking about that at all. That's, what, that's not what it's talking about. But it says all Israel shall be saved. Now, let's let's go down to this because this this part, right, verse 28 is a very important point, in my opinion. This is a very important point that it touches on a few topics that many Christians like get confused. But verse 28, Romans 11, verse 28, it says, as concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. So who is the they? The they is talking about the Gentiles. These Gentiles right here, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. So like I said before, Christ, not Christ, Yahweh, he, he still loves these people. That's why he says don't boast against the branches because he, he still loves them. He doesn't want you to sit there and, you know, brag on them and, and to knock them down and just, you know, break them down. Like, no, build them up. Try to get them to come back to their original, their original state, their original roots. But he's saying that they are enemies for your sakes. So these are the enemies. When the Bible says love your enemies, let me, let me bring, it up, bring it up real quick. A lot, of, a lot of Christians sit here and think that, oh, anybody is your enemy. Everybody can be your enemy. Let me see. I think it's this verse right here. Matthew 5, 43, it says, Ye have heard that it hath been said that thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate, thy, and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, Love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them that wish to spot, to spotfully use you and persecute you. So these enemies are talking about this right here. When it says they are enemies, it's talking about these Gentiles right here. These Gentiles, who, they are still our people, but they are enemies because of the fact that they are, they are broken off branches. So... When it says love your enemies, it's, it's, it never said to love, you know what I'm saying, um, anybody else. At the same time, though, there is a difference between, you know, the love that you that you give out to other people. I'm not sitting here saying just go around and just hate everybody that's not your people. I know. At the same time, you, you can still go around and, and have, I guess, um, you know, very civil conversations. And you, you can be in, in, a, in, a, um, in an environment with people who are not your people. And, and still be good. You don't got to sit there and just go around just, you know, hating everybody that's not your people. You know what I'm saying? But at the same time, though, like, when it comes down to who the enemies you should love, it's referring to your people. Even the neighbor, the neighbor that you should love, it's referring to your people. It's not referring to anybody else but your people. So when it says love your enemies and love your neighbor, your neighbor and your enemies are your people. And the enemy, the true enemy, is Esau, Edom, the devil. So you're telling me that God wants us to love the devil? That doesn't make any sense. Why would Yahweh want us, want us to love the devil if you know he's the true enemy? That, that's contradicting to, you know, his word. One of the, they want, how, 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 why would God want us to love him and the devil at the same time? That doesn't make any sense at all. But then there's, a verse in, there's also a verse in the Bible that says, no, um, love not the world, something like that. So why, why would we want, but like, it's, 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 it's a lot of things that y'all say that sounds contradicting because y'all y'all make the Bible contradicting because of what y'all believe in. But when you when you have a, like a true understanding of the word, you'll see how everything is, is lined up with, with, you know, each other. So in this context, it's not talking about, you know, when it says the Gentiles, the Gentiles is not. I'm not going to say always, but these Gentiles right here is in reference to um, what you call it. Uh, Israelites who were converted to Gentiles, basically. Because I'm going to also bring up this verse real quick. Um, I think it's 1 Corinthians. First Corinthians 12 and 2. 
It says, ye know that ye were Gentiles, carried away unto these dumb idols, even as ye were led. So who is he talking to? I think that this is Paul speaking. Who is he talking to? He's talking about, he's talking to, to the, um, the Israelites, saying that ye were Gentiles. So at one point, you was this. But at, at, as time went on, you were carried away into these dumb idols and became this. You became a Gentile. You were a Gentile, you were a Gentile convert. That's what it means. It's also a verse um, talking about Gentiles by flesh. Give me a second. Let me see. There's a verse Gentile and flesh. It's not playing with me. Um, flesh, Gentile. I know there's a fed, there's a verse for a fed that talks about Gentiles by flesh. Ephesians two and eleven. There we go. Had to go to my phone real quick. So, so right here, Ephesians 2 and 11. Wherefore, remember that ye being a time past Gentiles in the flesh. Talking to the Israelites. He's saying that ye remember that being a time past Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by that which is called the circumcision in the flesh made by hands. So they were Gentiles, as it says right here in this verse 2. Ye were Gentiles, 1 Corinthians 2, 12 and 2, ye were Gentiles. So when it, when it talks about the Gentiles, it's not talking about, you know what I'm saying, um, actual, you know, heathen people, actual Greek people. It's referring to um, Israelites. So I gave y'all many verses, many verses that let you know who these Gentiles are and also who Christ came for. And there's a lot of verses in the Bible that let you know that Christ came for Israel and only them. Many of them. T too many to count. Too many to count. He's called the God of Israel. It's, 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 it's so much knowledge and so much precepts you can bring up. But I'm not going to like bombard y'all with too much. You know what I'm saying? But one last thing that I wanted to do to kind of, um, in a sense, wrap up this whole video is to explain, you know, how these Gentiles or how these um, Israelites were converted to Gentiles. So as y'all remember in Deuteronomy, when I said that they were scattered to um, Gentile land, basically. And how in their land, oh, let me bring up this verse real quick. Let me see what verse it was. I think it was Luke 21. Because there was a period of time, or it's, it's still going on right now, but in the Bible, it's, it's prophesied. Um, it's prophesied how um, the Gentiles, they will take our land and they will be taken over, like, you know, with what we have. So in Luke 21, 24, it says, and they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. This is talking about the Israelites. So these Israelites, they were taken captive. In Jerusalem, they're just talking about Israel, the Israelites, Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. All this stuff is, is, is you know, letting you know exactly what's going on in history. How in history, you know what I'm saying, our people in our land, it was taken from us. So we had to work to get all that back. So as of right now, we're not in our original land because it's, it's taken by the Gentiles. That's, that's what's going on. Because even if you go to Romans um, 9 and 4, when it says, who are Israelites? No, not, not that verse. Um, Romans 9 and... Where is that? 9 and 6. There we go, 9 and 6. When it says, not as though the word of God have taken an effect, for they are not Israel, but are of Israel. So just because they're they're you know in Israel right now does not make them Israelite at all. Because we first for, for one, we're not in our original land, first one. And for two, it also said the word of God has taken an effect. I can do a, I can do a, a kind of like you know a little lesson on Romans on Romans 9, but I wanted to just stay in the whole context of just you know these Gentiles and you know who, who they are and how they came to be and how these Gentile converts came to be. But before, before I get into that, let me go to first Maccabees real quick. First Maccabees four. First Maccabees four. 
And I'm going to go down to verse 59. And right now, I'm like in the comfort of my own home. So I'm doing this from my bed. So, you know, you may hear like a lot of squeaking throughout this video of the bed and everything, but I'm just moving around trying to get comfortable. You know what I'm saying? But first Maccabees, this is um, in the Apocrypha. So if you don't have the Apocrypha, if you don't have an Apocrypha, I advise y'all to get one or if you, you can either buy one online or if you don't want to buy anything online, you can just use, you know, this app. Uh, it's called um, KJV um, with Apocrypha. You can, you can look it up on um, App, Apple Store or um, Google Play, whatever you have that, you know, you just look it up and it, it's, it's very, it's very important to have, very important to have. A lot of other text, textbooks too, but, um, you know, the Apocrypha is very important to have though. But as I, as I said, you know, before, how in Deuteronomy 30 and other verses too, how I said how um the Gentiles, that they will have our land, basically, or that we will be scattered to, you know, land. You know what I'm saying? That we won't be in our original land. We'll be, you know, in the land of the Gentiles or land of the heathen. So I'm going to read this verse right here. First Maccabees chapter 4, verse 59. It says, Moreover, Judas and his brethren, with the whole congregation of Israel, ordained that the days of dedication of the altar should be kept in their season from year to year by the space of eight days from the five and, from the five and 20th day of the month, cast loose with mirth and gladness. So right here is referring to um what you call it uh, a practice. This is a practice or a custom that the Israelites keep. So no matter where the Israelites go, they keep the, they keep their customs, they keep their ways, they keep their practices. They 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 always do anything for God. You know what I'm saying? They make sure that they keep everything that they used to do, whether it be you know celebrating certain holidays, whatever they do, they always keep that everywhere they go. Whether it be whether if they're not in their homeland or not. They're in their homeland or not, they're going to still continue to keep their dedication of altars, keep their days, keep keep their um, you know, what I'm saying uh, Sabbaths. They're going to do all that stuff. You know what I'm saying? But um, continue to read. It says at that time also they built it up the mount up the Mount Sion with high walls and strong towers round about, lest the Gentiles should come and tread it down as they had done before. So in but right now, like I said, they're not they're not in their land, but um, the Gentiles, though, they always had a plan to want to like destroy anything that they built up. Anytime that you know, um, the Gentiles came and tried to, you know, um, what you call it, uh, not the Gentiles, anytime the Israelites try to keep their holidays and build altars and stuff like that, the Gentiles always came to break it down. So it, it can continue to read, it said, and they set there and they set there a garrison to keep it and fortify the server to. To preserve it, that the people might have a defense against Idumia. So when you look at that word Idumia, Idumia means Edom. It's referring to uh, Edomites, basically. That's 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 the same thing as Esau, Edom, Idumia. They're all the same thing. And if you do know, like Esau is the quote unquote uh, white man, white woman, and child in the Bible, as as we, as we should already know. But I'm also do a video, you know, break it down Esau as well. I have many videos in the future. I'm gonna break. I'm gonna break down, you know, a lot of stuff. But, you know what I'm saying, just kind of give a little bit of, of an idea of what's going on. Um, Idumia is referring to Edom or the Edomites or Esau. And I'm going to go to the next chapter to let you know what they did. So right here, it says, now when the nations, in 1 Maccabees chapter 5, verse 1, now when the nations round about, these nations are the other people, the Gentiles. When these nations round about heard that the altar was, was, that the altar was built and the sanctuary renewed as before, it displeased them very much. So. If y'all know um, about Jacob and Esau, or not even just Jacob and Esau, because it goes back to Adam and Eve, that that uh, that curse that Adam and Eve uh, had with the serpent, where um, God said that that the Eve, Eve seed and um, the serpent seed will have hate or enmity towards each other. So this is a this is a you know tes testament to that, because of the fact that anytime the Gentiles or anytime the Israelites try to do something, the Gentiles always had hate for it. They try to break it down. They try to build it down. They didn't want to, like, you know, have them take over their homeland. You know what I'm saying? So it said it displeased them very much. Then it said, wherefore they thought to destroy the generation of Jacob that was among them. And thereupon they began to slay and destroy the people. Then Judas fought against the children of Esau and Idumia. 
So right here, this is all going back to, you know, Genesis and how, you know, Jacob and Esau had hate for each other. And there are many other verses I could bring up and let you know how Jacob had, you know, a, a, a huge hatred toward his brother um, Esau. So this right here is this right here is just kind of like context. It's letting us know how, first of all, there are um, what you call it, um, Israelites in Gentile, in Gentile land. Like they're not in their original land, they're in Gentile land right now. But now let's go to second Maccabees real quick. I'm gonna go second Maccabees and four, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, second Maccabees and four. And this is this this is how the um, Israelites were converted to Gentiles. So I'm gonna start at verse seven. It reads, "But after the death of Seleucus, when Antiochus called Epiphanes took the kingdom, Jason, the brother of Onias, and Jason, he's the Israelite. He's one of those wicked wicked Israelites who partnered up with you know the Gentiles, basically. But Jason, the brother of Onias, labored under hand to be high priest, promising unto the king by intercession three hundred and three score talents of silver." and of another revenue, 80, 80 talents. Verse nine, beside this, he promised to assign 150 more if he might have, have license to set him up a place of exercise and for the training up of youth in the fashions of the what? The heathen. Now, let's, let's look at the word Gentile real quick. I'm gonna just look at the word Gentile real quick. Um, I'm let y'all know what that word means. Well, not in this sense, but hold up, because this is a different context. Because there's there's always a different context behind the word Gentile, so it's not going to be always the same definition. Because once again, like I said, there are there are two different Gentiles in the Bible. We got Gentiles. Who are um, Gentile by blood, then you got Gentiles by flesh. Let me see. Um, I think it's right here. Um, where is it at? Heathen, there we go. Gentile heathen, right here. That's that's another word for Gentile heathen. Heathen Gentile heathen nation people. That's what the word Gentile means. So the same thing back right here when it says um a place of exercise for the training up of the youth in the fashions of the heathen. Then you can go back to Hellenization right here. The adoption of Greek culture, religion, language, and identity by non Greeks. And even when you go back to right here. Right here, ancient Greek culture by the Greeks, conquered by Greeks. All this stuff is in line with you know um, each other. Let you know how this is how um, you know everything came about. So the fashion of the heathen to write them a Jerusalem by the name Antiochus, which when the king had granted, he had gotten into his hand the rule he fought with, brought his brought his own nation to Greekish fashion. Checkmate, right there. Checkmate. This is how Hellenization happened. This is how those Israelites became Gentiles through Hellenization, through this right here, the spread of ancient Greek, Greek culture, and through this dude Jason, this wicked Israelite right here, he converted his he he helped convert his own people, his own nation of Israel, to the Greek way of living, to the Greek Greek faction. That, that is how Hellenization happened. That is why when you go back to, you know, these verses, talking about the Gentiles, it's always referring to, you know what I'm saying, um, what you call it? Uh, what you call it? Um, basically like the Israelites. So when it says right here, when it says in these verses, oh, um, it says that the soul of man doeth evil of the Jew first, and also the Gentile, um, Work of good to the Jew first and Gentile. So anytime it, it talks about, you know what I'm saying, like giving salvation or to the Gentile, whatever it may be, it's not always referring to, you know, um, and uh what you call it, a Gentile by blood. It's talking about a Gentile by flesh, meaning that they had to be converted. 
basically. Because even once again, when you look up this word Gentile in the um in the Greek, it's talking about a Hellenist. Because even let me see right here. Helene, like but look, it, it all stems from the word Helen. Or like like in, that's like the root word for Hellenization, basically. Like a Hellenist. Let me see the entry of it real quick. The sentence of Thessalon Hellas. Okay, basically of like the Hellenist period. So in, in this whole, what's it called it? In, in this whole lesson, hopefully y'all y'all learned, you know what I'm saying, exactly who the Gentiles were, who the Israelites are in terms of like, you know, salvation and who can receive salvation because a lot of people get, get misconstrued the whole concept of the salvation thing and that it's for everybody when it's not. I gave y'all many verses talking about who salvation was for. I gave y'all many, you know, much information and knowledge about, you know, these, these Gentiles and the difference between different Gentiles where you have Gentiles by flesh and Gentiles by blood and how the Gentiles by blood that they were the, they were the ones who don't receive salvation, but Gentiles by flesh were Israelites who were converted to Gentiles and also, when you go to uh, Romans 9, it talks about how they were, not Romans 9, Romans 11, when it talks about how they were the enemies that we should love. If you just bring up the right precepts and everything and, and you know, connect the right things, you'll, you'll understand exactly you know, what the Bible's talking about. Exactly what the Bible's talking about. So hopefully y'all, you know, um, hopefully y'all uh, learned a lot from this video. Um, I got a lot more videos on the way, a lot more videos on the way. I'm, I'm going to like try to upload, like I said, as much as I can, because I got a whole three week break, you know what I'm saying, from from like my job and from uh, college. So I got I got a lot of time on my hands to be productive, to give out this word, to make sure that y'all are edified in some way, shape or form. And I'm going to make sure I'm going to continue to spread the word of the Hawabashim, Yahawashah, until, until, you know, it's over. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to continue to spread this word. I'm going to continue to gain knowledge. I'm going to continue to give knowledge, whatever it may be. If, 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 if it's a uh, Lord's will, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm going to continue to do it. You know what I'm saying? But that's really all I have for this video. Um, like I said, hopefully y'all learned anything. And um, if there's any questions, any comments, any concerns, any, any doubts, anything that you may want to debate, anything that y'all may want to talk about, discuss on, you can put it in the comment section. Whatever it may be, like you can talk about it whatever you want, like we're going to try to discuss it as much as we can and try to learn things, edify each other, you know what I'm saying? So that's really all I got for this video, but hopefully y'all enjoyed this. Um, y'all stay prayed up. And also stay in your word, stay in your word, because that's that's what that's all we really got, you know what I'm saying? We got each other and we got this word. We got Yahweh on our side. And as long as we do, as long as we, as long as we stay consistent in this word, we'll be all right. We'll be all right. We can't sit here and let anything distract us. We gotta stay prayed up and stay focused on God's word and his will. So hopefully, like I said, hopefully this video helped y'all in some way, shape, or form. I got more videos on the way and I'm gonna explain a lot more stuff. But until then, till next time, see y'all.